Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 13th interview conducted as part of the Engage EU project. This project is carried out by European Institute for European Policy and with the support of the European Parliament. Today, we will speak with Ms. Sirpa Pietikainen, a member of the European Parliament from Finland, who is a member of the European People's Party. Uh, my name is Katarina Davidova. I'm a research fellow at Europium, and I will be guiding you through today's interview. Hello, Sirpa. Hello. Thank you very much uh, for being here today with us. Um, let's start with the questions. Um, even though most of us are uh, currently focusing on, on the Russian aggression in Ukraine, um, let's go back a little bit to the COVID-19 pandemic. What sectors and areas were the most affected by the pandemic? Well, I would need to say that uh, all the sectors are affected uh, heavily and all different types of the people are affected heavily also. For example, the mental stress and load for first line uh, nurses and doctors, the people working in the care sector, the informal carers taking care of the people at home, uh, the, the people staying at home, the young people, students uh, with quite stressful situations with their studies and so on. Uh, uh, of course, there are some sectors that I uh, hit even more. And of course, in the forefront is the hospitality sector altogether, and especially the travel. And uh, of course, then uh, one, one is uh, the, the, the traffic in general. We all know how it goes with, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, flights and uh, trains and uh, buses and, and all that. Yeah, my second question uh, will actually focus on these sectors. So how should we proceed now to make sure that the recovery in sectors such as hospitality, tourism and transport is more sustainable in the future and the growth of these sectors does not overburden the environment? Well, this is a big and very important question. First of all, we should be much more aware of the pandemics. Uh, we have had the... Uh, uh, quite severe warnings of the uh, WHO already. But now the EU Europe has taken the actions uh, with this uh, EU for Health program and uh, uh, this uh, health union so that we could be much better and easily uh, tracking down the viruses, spreading diseases, setting uh, coherent uh, uh, travel restrictions or uh, requirements of uh, vaccinations, masks or whatever, and provide, uh, of course, then prepared, for example, in the hospitals. And I think that it should be extended in the way that now when we have the lessons learned uh, from the health wise, uh, we would need to, uh, need to take the precautionary uh, principle and that kind of a <clears throat> action plan for all, uh, all actors. Uh, when and how they take the precautionary uh, uh, actions, le le disinfecting the hands, using the masks, uh, uh, trying to uh, put a smaller sections of people in one places. Uh, and especially important is the very good uh, air quality. So the air conditioning in, in, in hotels and in uh, 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 airplanes that is fairly good already, but trains and all that. So this is one part. But then we know that the climate change and big environmental challenges are ahead of us. They have not gone anywhere. And by the same way, you should take precautionary actions there and ask in all of those sectors and actors, so individual companies, what needs to happen that my business is sustainable by 2030, 35, depending what is possible. And that means as close to climate neutrality as possible. Uh, that means not harming the biodiversity and if possible, compensating it on the biodiversity because the tourism is also very consuming on the nature. Taking into account the good working conditions and the societal uh, uh, impacts uh, that we know are growing concern of the local population, plus then uh, 
of course, uh, the uh, indigenous people and and their needs. And that needs this kind of a very sensitive planning and uh, um, maybe action, actions also by the governments and the EU that we should have a strong hold on, on tourism too. To, to see what is uh, the mm, sustainable management on hospitality sector, because we just can't overflow f- Venice or the uh, uh, Eiffel Tower or uh, any other places uh, with growing numbers of people. And we need to sort of set limits about the, the, the visitors and uh, uh, scheduled timelines and, and whatever uh, the specialists would need to think in, in detail. Thank you. Uh, When talking about uh, climate change and its mitigation, the the challenge, one of the challenges is that the decisions that are made today will only show benefits uh, in the decades to come. So how, in your opinion, can we make sure that policymakers today enact the necessary uh, changes in order to prevent the dangerous effects of, of climate change in the future? We would uh, need to put it on place in uh, the, the four principles. First of all, we would need to understand that these impacts uh, are cumulative and the change uh, is exponential, as we know. So uh, more people, more consumption, more tourism, more this and that. And uh, it is not linear increase, it is exponential increase of impact. So you would need to backcast. That means look where you need to be and uh, uh, make the uh, decisions effective enough already today. Exactly because today we are making the decisions how the world looks after 10 years. And so it needs to be science-based. It needs to be based on precautionary principle. It would need to be based on uh, on ecological comp- uh, competencies in companies and ac- uh, the other actors. And uh, beside that, what we really would need there is these transition plans, what I I said. So you would need to plan it uh, step by step. And last but not least, and this is my suggestion for legislation, always when you make impact assessment, you should uh, include the cost of non-action. Because nowadays it looks like, you know, well, you need to change, it's difficult, it's costly, and, and why do I need to do that? And then if you only imagine that it is estimated that the climate change costs for the Uh, total economy is tenfold or even more. Some people are saying, scientists are saying even up to hundredfold of the COVID-19 costs. Everybody can understand that none of the economies can survive and we people cannot survive. So it is always cheaper and more profitable to act now and not to postpone it later. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the cost of inaction. I think it's also very important. Um, to highlight this. On to the next question. Um, uh, To help European economies recover, um, the EU passed the historic recovery and resilience facility, um, which focuses mostly on the twin transition, the green and digital, um, and it conditions the delivery of the funds uh, by the investment into these two areas. So what, in your opinion, are the most important and effective measures and areas of investment that the member states should be focusing on. And uh, here I will take the Ukrainian war and crisis uh, back to the table. We would need to uh, uh, stop uh, uh, importing the fossil energy from Russia as soon as possible. It is a security issue. And we are paying every day Uh, roughly 800 million uh, euros to Putin's pockets to to fund this war. And while we are doing this, we would actually improve our energy security and independence. And what it would mean is that, of course, now for the upcoming months, we would need to get the whatever coal or gas uh, and oil where we can get it. But if we heavily invest all this uh, RRF money, so the savings package money, 
uh, the uh, renewable energy, solar panels on the roofs of houses, and on the energy efficiency of the buildings. According to the specialists, it would only take from two to three years we would cut uh, the uh, total independence and it would be replaced uh, by mainly solar and wind uh, sources. And one have to remember, no one own, uh, owns the wind or the solar, so you can't be blackmailed by that. But uh, most of the sources of fossil fuel are not that nice countries and uh, not so respectful of human rights or the environment either. So it has that dimension as well. Thank you. Um, one more question, um, going back to the pandemic again. Do you think that uh, it has helped people to realize that there is even a bigger existential crisis looming in the background and that is climate change? Or do you think that we have uh, redi redirected our attention to more short-term problems as a result? Well, I hope it would have. And there are a lot of signs that especially young people uh, are experience, experiencing this very strongly. You know, it is sudden threat that, uh, of course, you had always talked about pandemic and that could happen and so on, but you never sort of really thought it could hit me on my lifetime or change so drastically the everyday life. And now then, if you compare with the climate change, suddenly it makes the realization this could be uh, uh, this could be not even the worst what we could see if we do not act. But then again, there are a lot of voices of people that are sort of distracted with this uh, pandemia, um, uh, putting the environmental issues to say, no, 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 we shouldn't talk about the environment now. We should deal first with the COVID, deal first with the, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine. We would need to do this first. And then again, and this is what you asked, it is a lot long-term decisions and investments, you postpone the decisions you actually should have made yesterday. And uh, this is something that we really need to raise the awareness and campaigning and uh, contain the uh, support and pressure to politicians, especially on member state level. We need it in the European Parliament and uh, Europe too, but especially on the member states, this seems to be sometimes a sort of a secondary issue to everyday worries. Right. Um, I think we have time for one final question. I would like to ask something more personal. Now, um, what does your uh, typical working day look like nowadays, especially with uh, the many crises uh, going on at the moment? Well, I get up usually around six o'clock in the morning and I have my first meetings at eight o'clock and I walk, work, uh, uh, work the whole day through up to, to eight to ten o'clock in the evening. And of course, there are sort of a two tracks. One track is the work that I'm doing anyway, like I'm the rapporteur on the environmental criminal law or the pay transparency. You have to negotiate these and uh, find compromises and, and all that and hear other people's opinions and to include that and try to learn the substance uh, all the time better. But now, uh, it, it first it was COVID and now it is with the crisis. There's sort of a second, second package simultaneously the meetings and the contacts and uh, study needs about uh, uh, what we would need to do in Europe uh, because of this Ukrainian crisis, how to deal with the uh, issue of uh, people leaving, uh, leaving, how to finance that, how to find education and all that and how to support that, how to speed up the energy transition I was talking about how to put uh, pressure to, to stop the, uh, uh, the uh, imports of the fossil fuels to Europe and uh, how to this and that. And still there's a lot of issues, as, as you said, with the COVID-19 that continues. How you secure proper care in the Europe 
so that all people in different kind of a crisis would get the care. Thank you very much for this uh, personal insight. And with that, I would like to wrap up uh, today's interview. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pietikainen, uh, for being part of it. And also thank you to our viewers for watching. This was already the 13th uh, interview in a series uh, of interviews with MEPs, uh, which are conducted under the Engage EU project. Over the upcoming weeks, we will publish another 11 interviews with both Czech and foreign MEPs. You can follow our social media on Facebook and Instagram to get updates of, on future interviews and other interesting project outputs. Also, I would like to invite our Czech speaking viewers to visit our website at www.zapoise.eu for more content such as quiz games, information about the European Parliament and its weekly agenda, or about the European post-pandemic recovery. Thank you very much for watching and have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. All the best. <laughs>